Um, welcome to Alessandra Vinciguera, our speaker for this evening. Um, I have already told a few of us who were in early that she saved the day because our Chilean speaker actually fell over and had an accident and Alessandra just said, no problem, don't worry about it, Angela, I can do it. And this is on the eve of the opening of the garden to the public, so um, there's not a small amount to be done. Um, I have incredible memories of uh, La Mortella because uh, it was the first trip I ever organized for the MGS back in 2012. And I was on a high state of tension and alert because this little group, we had to get on a ferry from Naples and so on. And it was all pretty, you know, overwhelming. And she was just so nice. And in Italian, we say alla mano, um, so approachable, so generous, so kind. And it, once again, this is how, um, she has been, she's uh, saved us tonight and I'm delighted that we're all gonna be able to visit this garden with her. So now, Alessandra, I will ask you if you would share your screen. Screen, yes. We start with a nice picture. This is, uh, these are William and Susanna Walton who are the creators of the gardens La Mortella. La Mortella is, as you all know, in Ischia, which is an island off the Bay of Naples. And it was uh, um, created by this, uh, this couple, the unusual couple of Anglo-Argentinian expatriates. William Walton is one of the most important musicians of the 20th century, he's British. He uh, was born in 1902 and became famous very young when he was 20. He wrote uh, several compositions, including the march for the coronation of King of then King uh, George VI, and then one for Queen Elizabeth. He wrote symphonies, uh, uh, concertos, compositions, and so on. At the age of 46, during a, a journey in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, he met a much younger uh, girl, Susanna Walton. Here you see William composing. Susanna, uh, at the time, Susanna Hill was uh, 22. And uh, it was love at first sight. In uh, mm, two months' time, they got married. To the desperation of her family, because they thought she was uh, too young, he was much older than her. And also his friends were very um, upset because they thought she was a sort of adventurer who was after his money. But actually it was a very successful marriage and it lasted 35 years. Can I ask mute please? Could you please mute yourself? Thank you. Keith Davis, please mute yourself. So the Walton decided from the start to pass part of their time of the year in, uh, in Italy, in, um, somewhere in the south at the beginning. William had traveled in Italy when he was young and he loved the place and he wanted to live in a place full of uh, um, light and sun and to, to have a sort of retreat where he could compose in peace. And so they chose to come to Ischia. Ischia is a volcanic island, has always been known as the Green Island. And of course, in this picture, you see a lot of houses, but at the time it was very, very poor, very simple. Italy was just out of the war. Uh, we are talking 1948, and they uh, moved to Ischia, driving their huge Bentley car, quite, uh, um, you know, without really knowing what they were going to see, what, where they were going to, to live. So they crossed the bay with this very uh, dangerous looking kind of ferry. Imagine uh, loading a Bentley on one of these boats. And they arrived in Forio, a little villages, villagers uh, um, near the west side of the island. It's a fisherman uh, village, very quiet, very simple, very sunny. And what was meant to be only uh, a short time, a few months in the first year became a habit. What the Waltons kept coming back to Ischia every year for longer and longer time. They actually fell in love with the place and eventually they decided to buy land. Now, this is a very old photograph that shows the place where the, at that time in the fifties, when the Waltons bought the property. Uh, this is where the garden more or less is today. So it is this sort of flattish area that we call the valley and then the side of the hill. Well, the photo is in black and white, so it really looks even worse than it was, but it was very unpromising. So much so that uh, Sir uh, Lawrence Olivier, who was uh, uh, their best friend, uh, the Shakespearean actor, told them, you know, you will never manage to make a garden out of this. This looks like a, a stone quarry. 
But fortunately, the Waltons believed they could, and they started uh, to uh, create a garden. They love the place, especially because it looks west, uh, and it enjoys this wonderful uh, sunset. But also, um, but also the, the place they had selected, uh, even though it was full of stones, was also sheltered from the northerly winds. It was very um, uh, sheltered in general, looking west so it could enjoy longer hours of sun during the year, especially in the winter. And also, Susanna, Lady Walton always said, it had uh, something that you couldn't find anywhere else in the island, acid soil, acidic soil, because the island is almost everywhere clay, clayish, so it's limey, whereas here, this little valley, where for hundreds of years, uh, you know, vegetation, foliage, and so on had mulched, had a good black soil. So off they started, and they started to create a garden. Now, Lady Walton had read the book, The Education of the Gardener by uh, Russell Page, that she had uh, loved so much. So it was like her Bible. She even you know, ruined it, consumed it. And, um, and the Waltons managed to get in touch with Russell Page through a common friend and invited him to come to Ischia to design their garden. Russell was very happy to do it because he admired William Walton's music, but also because uh, um, for him, it was a special challenge to design a garden for an artist, not for the rich, you know, the wealthy and famous people he had worked for until then. So from the beginning, the garden had to add a very special concept. It had to be a garden for inspiration, for meditation, for an artist, not a garden to show off, but for people who were really interested in sort of the, in the cultural uh, forces of the spirit. And um, in his memories, he says, I had an artist, I had a very special place that looked like a huge stone garden. And I had also the wife of an artist, as Susanna said, who was crazy about plants. She was the gardener of the two. She had traveled all the way from Argentina carrying seeds of her favorite trees. And she was ready to create something special. At the beginning, things were not easy. You can see, uh, we have a big gap in the middle here because the Walton hadn't managed to buy the last piece of land to make it a whole. Some of the local peasants were resisting and wanted more money, but also there was no water at all in the island. If we look at this close up, you see silver plant garden cistern. That's where they had to collect rainwater. And then, you know, mimosas and their suggestion for trees that were, you know, able to withstand the drought and the hot summers. And so this was the beginning. And as I said, it wasn't easy. This is my office. This is uh, the drawing that I showed you is still hanging there. We keep it also as a, a memento of what has been. And the friendship between Susanna and Russell Page is, uh, uh, you know, remembered in this wonderful inscription we have in one of the books. She had to buy a new copy of The Education of a Gardener because she had ruined the old one. So this is a picture taken soon after the house was finished and the garden was still you know, going on. And as you see, there are retaining walls everywhere. Lady Walton said for 10 years, she, they didn't do anything but breaking stones and making retaining walls. Everywhere the garden needed to be landscape and the soil had to be somehow modeled. The house newly built was very simple, very simple lines as you see. Local people hated it because they said it looked like a barrack. It didn't look like the Spanish demoresque style that was favored at the time. And everything, as you see, looks very dry and uh, sun scorched and bare. Now look at these pine trees. And this is the same view today. As you see, 60 years later, things have really changed. The trees that were planted according to Russell Page's plan, very small and thin because they should grow and uh, you know get accustomed to the soil and then uh, start to grow and make a good root uh, system before they became too tall and be hit by the, the winds have now grown everywhere and they cast shade to the garden. So this is the valley today. The lower garden, it was uh, sunny, it was rocky, it was dry. So much so that uh, William Walton kept asking his wife, Susanna, are you sure we're going to see a garden here sooner or later? And she said, yes, William, of course, believe me. Today, this is what we have. Tall trees that shelter, that cast a shade, that shelter the whole uh, lower garden. 
moisture, as I said, uh, as I told you, the island has always been the green island is moister than the other island is in this area, but still we have a sprinkling system that helps. But also Russell Page designed many fountains once the water was brought in with an aqueduct that runs under the sea from Naples to Ischia. Having the water, he could design fountains that today uh, punctuate the lower garden. <coughs> so now today we have the Valley Garden, the old historical garden that is shady, moist, rich of uh, water with all these fountains that murmur, that uh, create music, that create sound. It is after all the garden of a musician. All these trees attract birds. So again, we have more music. And the whole atmosphere is that of this sheltered place. Nowhere in the lower garden, you see the rest of the island. You don't see the beach, you don't see the mountain. <laughs> you are just in this place that is detached from the rest of the world. And it's very, very green. The whole lower garden has become a tropical, well, let's say subtropical garden. And it's full of the plants that Lady Walton loved, the Argentinian plants of her youth and the plants she collected during you know, trips and um, exchanges and uh, shopping expedition throughout the world. So this is the first fountain that you meet when you visit the garden. We call it the four-sided fountain, fountain because it has four beds that you see here for um, bog plants. And here you can see it in the spring, so covered with the petals of the mimosas. And it is, uh, uh, this, let's say, the beginning of this very long and narrow valley. And, oh, sorry. Here you see one of the sketches that Russell prepared, Walton House Ischia, in 19, from 57 to 77. That's when he worked, so for 20 years. And this gives you pretty much an idea of what the valley is. Here you enter. There is this long drive. The garden develops in this area. So this is the first fountain. And when he designed it, that was one fountain. And then you had the main big pond that I will show you later. And this is the house. So the picture that we saw before with all the dry walling was taken from here towards the house. Um, for the 80th birthday of uh, Sir William, uh, Russell Page designed another fountain and the rill of water that today is one of the most interesting and famous uh, um, features of this garden. So the rill of water goes all the way in the, through the length of the valley and adds uh, a movement, color and sound to this part of, uh, of the garden. All along it, we find uh, hydrangeas, uh, uh, anemones, and plants that love the moisture of the place. And it connects uh, visually. You see, this is the first fountain that I showed you. And that is a second fountain with eight sides because it was for the 80th birthday of uh, Sir William. So it really creates uh, an interesting um, feature in the lower, in the lower part of the valley and visually connects the other fountains. And this is the main fountain. Is a long sort of egg-shaped fountain, and these are this is the part of the valley that I just showed you, and this is really the center. This is really the center of the lower garden. The picture is taken from the terrace of the house, so you see how tall it is and how low the valley is, and you can see a little bit of everything. On this side of the main uh, pond, we have the tree ferns and all shade-loving plants, as well as in this area, and on this side. We have more sun. This is the uh, walled, uh, dry walled area that I took, that I showed you in the first picture. And here we have sun loving plants. The main jet of the central fountain is a focal point for all the lower gardens. So all around this, everything uh, rotates and connects. And of course, having all that water, we can grow a lot of water plants, uh, water lilies, nymphaeas, it is direct or more. Eurialiferox and uh, uh, lotus, the lumbo, that grow in pretty much in all our fountains. This is a picture of the tree ferns. As I said, in the shady area, we have a lot of plants uh, like this that thrive on shade and moisture. This is a beautiful trunk of the black tree fern, the Siatea medullaris. Now, tree ferns arrived at La Mortella in 1962 when William Walton went for a tour to present his music to Australia and New Zealand, and Lady Walton could not go because she had broken a leg uh, as they were working, building the big fountain that I showed you. So to sort of uh, uh, appease her and to cheer her, he kept sending her uh, plants that uh, he found here and there 
in, uh, during his trip. And this is how metrosiders and tree ferns arrive. Now, tree ferns thrived so much that Russell Page told Susanna, you have to grow as many as you can. And so she kept adding, and we do add even today, we keep um, you know, buying and uh, raising from spores and new tree ferns and adding to the collection. Because so some have become too old and so sometimes they, they collapse. <clears throat> sometimes we have a you know, shortcut of water or maybe a heat wave in the summer. So they're not the easiest thing to grow, but they create wonderful corners. You see here the canopy they create that also gives more shade to other uh, plants, such as the staghorn ferns that you see, can see here. We also have Dixonias. Actually, we have ferns of every kind, possible kind. Look at these, these are the Sirtomium uh, ferns from Japan that self-seed everywhere. They were introduced by Lady Walton many years ago, but they self-seed everywhere in the crevices and in the stones. And then we have, uh, Typically, you see stones covered in moss and surrounded by other ferns. I, I hope you understand so the, what is the atmosphere of this lower garden. Totally un-Mediterranean, if you want, with so much moisture. But it's not so uncommon in Ischia, because here you see a woodwardia radicans, that is a, tree, uh, is a fern that grows uh, spontaneously in Ischia, in the gorges of the volcano. So in pockets where the moisture collects, uh, there have always been Ferns. So this Lady Walton collected the, during her trekkings uh, up on the mountain. So it is not so in, unnatural for us to see ferns growing in the garden. And then we have a big collection of uh, camellias. I just, uh, uh, I'm just showing a few photos, many of the scented ones. This is uh, a fragrant girl, fragrant pink, sorry. Um, again, acid soil, moisture, shade is ideal. So we have uh, this very prolonged season of flowering because camellias start uh, in uh, October with the first one, Cleopatra, and then go on, on and on. We still have now, it's May, some camellias, the Japonica, the late Japonicas in bloom. So we have a continuous display of flowers, uh, of flowering huge shrubs uh, throughout the winter. Some of them, the oldest one, are have today you know, really tree size and they grow everywhere. Another thing that is typical in this garden is the foliage just up positions. You see giant arrows, you see strelitzias, and then uh, formules here and there's so many cycas that I will show you later. But this is again another view that you are now familiar with of the same uh, uh, area of the garden. So you see here we have the dark uh, or the shady and moist area. And here we have the sunny one just below the house in those uh, uh, infamous uh, dry air beds that I showed you before. And this is uh, the same, uh, you know, the opposite shot. So you see when I was mentioning dry loving plants, you see the yuccas we have. We have uh, the Brahea armata palm trees. We have many of the silver trees plant, a dazzelinum here, another dazzelinum here. This is the beautiful Braheas that bloom uh, abundantly in the summer, some of the cycads. Uh, this is the uh, sorry, Kalankoe um, from uh, Madagascar. And uh, one of our jewels, uh, the uh, Puya berteroniana, which is a, a terrestrial bromeliad from Chile that blooms every year. It is in bloom right now on one corner of that uh, uh, dry terraces uh, with these uh, incredible green flowers. You can see a close up of the flowers. This is really one of the stunning things in this garden that everybody stops to see, to look at. We have cycads, as I said, uh, many everywhere in the garden. Lady Walton loved them. They, she loved the plants that have a story. So these plants that have survived uh, uh, disasters, uh, the movements of the continents and everything, she thought they were so interesting. And she kept collecting them. When she bought these plants, it was possible. Today, she would have been probably arrested because of all the new, uh, you know, the, the correct, uh, the, the very rightly so legislation that prevent from you know, buying these plants if they're not uh, with uh, all the patents, all the required documents and so on. But she collected quite a lot. And we have them everywhere. This is uh, the famous, I hope you know that it, uh, uh, so-called Mojaji cycads, the, the one that comes from uh, um, South Africa. And it is uh, considered a sheltered, um, sort of a sacred plants for the tribe of Mojaji. 
And we have others in the little island bed that is in the middle of the pond that you see there. You will see others throughout the, the slideshow because I have many pictures of them. And we love them. And this is the beautiful Mexican Ceratosamia. Um, one very interesting feature of the garden in the spring months is this, uh, the geranium madarensis that uh, sell seeds everywhere in the garden. So every year you find them in different areas of the garden where they fancy to grow. They have these beautiful magenta flowers that really stand out in the spring. And here also you see the top fountain, which is this one, which is surrounded by aroids, giant aroids. And it, uh, it is sort of the end of the long walk in the lower garden. And it introduces to one of the most important uh, uh, glass houses we have, the Victoria House, where we, we grow Victoria Amazonica uh, giant fern. And this is the vignette that opens uh, when you grow there. This is a very favorite place for visitors. Um, because we not only have the beautiful pond with the Victorias, but also a lot of creepers, including this one, this turquoise blue that you see here, that is the so-called jade vine from Philippines. It's called Strongylodon macrobotris. It's a member of the pea family, so it is a giant uh, uh, on steroid uh, wisteria, let's say. And uh, it was given to us as a cutting from the Oxford Botanic Garden more than 20 years ago, and it blooms uh, with this incredible color. You can see it. Now that this fountain head you see here was carved by sculptor Simon Verity, who is uh, uh, British, but he lives and works in New York and he sculpted St. John's the Divine um, sculptor uh, frontal gate, uh, the church in New York City. And it is inspired by um, the front curtain that John Piper, the painter designed for a performance of William Walton's facade. Um, a work that he um, composed in uh, when he was 20 and it was the first of his career. So the, we consider the fountain a sort of a link between the music and uh, the garden. This is to Mberger that is also in the same glass um, house. And this is the famous uh, what, giant water lily or platter water lily, Victoria Amazonica, that we raise from seeds Every other year, we managed to keep it surviving for a couple of years. We also raised many, and one is in the glass house, and uh, it uh, overwinters, and the other ones are planted outdoors, and so they don't resist during the winter. The Victoria is famous because on the first day, the, flower, the beautiful scented flowers are white, and on the second day, they become pinkish. And that was one of the favorite plants of Lady Walton, totally. We also have many flowering trees in this lower garden, which is interesting because as we also have a hillside garden, when you climb the hill, you can look uh, down to the top of the trees, which is quite unusual. So this is a metrocedars that you are probably familiar with. Uh, this is one of those that originally were brought in by William Walton during his, uh, uh, when he came back from his trip in Australia and New Zealand. We also have, have a, a former Corizia, today Seiba Speciosa, raised from seeds by Lady Walton. She collected the seeds in Buenos Aires in 1983 when she went there for a memorial service. Uh, William had just died. So she planted this tree uh, to remember that time. And it blooms uh, in August and September and has these beautiful flowers that look like orchids. It's tall. It's one of the trees we have in the garden. We also have the magnolias that I showed you before. <laughs> we have huge uh, brugmansias, former this is the Brugmansia Grammarnier. They become really very tall. Look at the flowers. When you stand under them, it's like a shower of flowers on your head. We have a beautiful Spatodea, um, that is the, the, the so-called African tulip tree, uh, that we actually, the one we have today was raised from seeds from the previous one that died, <laughs> that Lady Walton had bought. So we have now a very big, uh, beautiful one in a very sheltered place near the rock. And from many of the tree trunks, we hang uh, epiphytes. This is a uh, uh, epiphytes, I think you say, I don't know. This is an orchid uh, that uh, has a wonderful uh, uh, vanilla scent and um, it's called Stanhopea. Then we have other orchids like the dendrobiums that actually overwinter outdoors and they grow almost everywhere on the trunks. We have many bromeliads, you see the tillandsias here. And again, the stagon ferns that I already showed you. We have many of the so-called uh, um, 
the three cacti, the epiphyllums uh, that hang down from the trees. And uh, at the eye level, at the ground level, we also use a lot of bromeliads uh, that we grow ourselves. Uh, and then uh, sometimes we take the pups and we bring them indoors and then we turn them out again, but most of the winter outdoors, as well as the cymbidium orchids. And you see, they create wonderful groups under the tree ferns and these big groups. We also use begonias. There's a lot of foliage going on, foliage composition going on in the garden. We have flowers as well, but the foliage are what really creates the bone of this lower garden. You see here my favorite, my beloved clevias that of course thrive in the heat. It, it in goes off and you can't get it back. And uh, in the shade, uh, we have both the, the red one and the yellow one, and now they are crossing, freely crossing. And this is iresina, which is also a wonderful foliage plant for shade. And these are well known, I think, the plectranthus, uh, the argentus, uh, and uh, uh, the batatas, the ipomea batatas. Now, all of these are come from cuttings that I brought back from New York in, uh, I think, 1998, 99. So I brought them, they were given to me by a friend and I keep propagate them and spread them to friends. Now people ask, uh, is all this uh, permanent? Yes, pretty much the lower garden is permanent. We do shelter some things when uh, winter arrives, but winter arrives very late. This picture was taken in December. So you see, this is the garden. And so you see, and you see the volcano here. This yellow flash is our ginkgo that changes its leaves in December, beginning of December. So you can judge how warm it is. We even have every 10 years or so, some really cold days. This picture is a sprinkle of snow we had in uh, uh, 2015. It only lasted a few hours, uh, just you know, enough time to take a few pictures. Uh, we rarely get to zero degrees centigrade uh, um, every, you know, very rarely, let's say every 50 or so, and in only for a day or two. So this is pretty much it. Uh, this is the lower garden. And I think we agreed I would stop yes. for a moment for whoever wants to, yeah. uh, you know, ask questions or whatever, and then I will keep on going on, hopefully. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to put, I'm going to go to gallery view now. Um, okay and see, um, you know, and if, and, and uh, if, has anybody written any questions on the chat at all? Or has anybody, uh, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and, um, uh, you know, go ahead. I actually can't see. No yeah. questions on the chat, Angela. No, okay, well, I, yeah. Um, before we go any further, could I just say I, I was on Angela's trip to um, uh, La Mortola in uh, 2012, and it's so lovely to have this tour back and see the detail. It's so overwhelming when you're there. It's such a wonderful garden, and I'm, I'm really, really appreciating this opportunity to see you know, the context, the history, and the detail of the planting, which is just magnificent. So thank you. I also would like to add that I think that it's true that almost when you you are in there, you, you literally you're just also we were there in September. So lots of these things that we're seeing on the photos, which are stunning, you know, wouldn't have been out for us to see at that time. Um, and the compliments for the photos, um, they're really, they're just, it's just amazing. Mm. Oh, somebody has, um, th there are two questions that have come on the chat. May I? Yes, read them please now? do. Please um, do. The, um, they literally, uh, firstly, could you please repeat the name of the red foliage plant, the shrub that you showed us? Yeah, the last one, that's called, uh, in Italian, we say iresine, which would be iris, like iris, iris, E, N, E. Okay. And um, um, whilst we're on plant names, um, uh, there's a question, uh, the, the name of the turquoise plant, the, I presume you mean the, the wisteria on steroids. <laughs> yeah, okay, we call it strongy, because strongy. the name is strong, like strong, strong Y, strongy, low, don, and then macrobotrys, which is just like wisteria macrobotrys. So it's strongy, low, don. 
Super, thank you. Um, For everybody, um, Jade Vine. You find it as a Jade, Jade Vine. Vine. Super. Now, somebody else is asking, it, with time, with all the plants you have, is the lower garden becoming more humid? Is the, is the micro climate becoming more Yes, humid? yes, definitely uh, it has. I mean, the, as the trees keep growing and uh, cast more shade, yes, the humidity rate is changing. Also, you have to know that we add uh, compost constantly. I mean, I can tell you the number of times we just spread more compost because it disappears uh, very fast. We are on a giant rock garden, as I said, uh, this huge rock. Actually, La Mortella is on a lava rock stream, I mean, frozen lava. So uh, it's solid lava everywhere, but through the centuries, I suppose earthquakes or whatever broke this lava. So there are huge uh, um, cracks. The local people uh, think uh, connect directly to the beach downstairs, which is not. But I mean, incredible drainage. Sometimes uh, the whole soil is like sucked in mm. by these huge things. So we need to add more and more. Lady Walton started, when she started the garden in the 60s, one of the things she did, she bought uh, all the um, the city, the, well, the village waste. Uh, at the time it was only organic. So she bought a lot of organic waste and then she was denounced for, you know, illegal uh, uh, dumping waste, but she actually did it and then she uh, composted it and started to make her own compost. Since then, everything the garden makes, we shred and, uh, and make huge mounds, and make compost and bring back. We mulch and compost, we mulch and compost, we mulch and compost. So this also has changed a lot in the, in the soil and in the humidity of the general, of the garden. May I just, uh, uh, final questions come in, if I may, um, and uh, somebody would like to know the geranium you, you may mention. Is that yeah, Maderense? geranium Maderense from Madeira Island. You can and raise it from seeds. Everywhere. Don't, don't uh, make mistakes because there is a geranium Maderense and then there is a geranium Canariense. So one is from the Madeira Island and one is from the Canary Island. The one we have is the Maderense that, is, uh, that makes like a shrub actually, but it is uh, a biennial. So you have to raise it from seeds and it lasts only two years, but then it sells seeds a lot. There is a white form also available, which is very beautiful, but you have to look for the seeds. Ah, and one, one person's asking now, sorry, another question's just come in. Um, uh, do you have a, a very extensive area in the, in the garden for propagating and oh, yes. bringing on the new plants and seeds? Oh, yes. We have, actually, it is on top of the house that you saw. We have uh, uh, what we call La Serra di Lavoro, so the working glass house in opposition to the other one that are for display. And uh, with all the, the, yeah, the beds where we make cuttings and seeds and so on, but we also have a part um, at the back of the main garden, which is a woodland area, a real wood, I mean, that we bought. Uh, that is where we make all the compost uh, and, uh, you know, and prepare the soil. So the, the work actually in the garden goes on two different, well, two, two parallel rows. One is plant propagation and so on. And the other one, soil preparation. And they can, and we can, we have to do both. We can do all in one of that. Alessandra, is that clear? Is that also true in the next garden that we go now yes. to? Yes. Because okay. now. Okay. Going... I just wanted to say one thing before I start with the upper sure. part of the garden. When you said overwhelmed, the first, the very first time I arrived here, and I was meant to have an interview with Lady Walton, and was preparing a, an exhibition about the gardens of Russell Page for the American Academy in Rome, where I worked at the time. And I came to visit her and I was meant to stay one couple of hours perhaps and to speak with her. I stayed the whole day. And then when I got out after 12 hours of talking plants with her, I decided to stay. So I, I ran to a hotel and booked a room because I thought I needed more time to see the garden. And the next day I was here for the next, for the following 12 hours or so. So the, the very first time I came to this garden, I needed something like 25 hours just to, to think I had seen it and I still discovered things today 20 years later. There's one last question so like, on the soil I believe from Christopher Picot. Can, yes. um, can you see it Yvonne? Sorry. 
I, I'm keeping the full screen on, so. Okay, yeah, yeah somebody's asking, um, uh, how much soil actually do you have there on top of the rocks? Or, or, oh, or do you want to create normally it's just a sort of a dusting of soil. It's very little. Mm -hmm. There are pockets between the rocks. And then wherever the retaining walls were built, so then the, the, the space, the creative space was filled in with composted soil, whenever it was mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a very mm -hmm. uh, precious uh, thing for our soil. We don't want to waste it. We try to, you know, to save it as much as possible because it's, it is expensive, you can buy it, and, uh, and it is uh, really precious. Okay, well, um, we, we, we're really looking forward to hearing the, the next. The Okay, so are we still in sharing, screen yeah. sharing, yeah. Angela? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so my next thing is, as you leave the lower garden, you take, you go under this arch and you start to uh, climb the hill with uh, a series of ramps and steps. And uh, almost immediately you sense that the atmosphere is changing because as you raise, you see this, you can recognize here uh, in the lower part the photo, the big pond that I showed you, but you start to take in the rest of the world. This is a little glimpse of the sea, and you can see a little bit of the village. And as you keep climbing and climbing, more of the outer world of the island, of the Mediterranean nature of the island comes in, enters in the landscape of the garden. So, you know, everything changes, really. That's the, the, the little village of Forio and the hotels that today punctuate the, the landscape. And uh, the local plants enter in the, in the picture. And we are very lucky because local plants, I mean, the, the, the Mediterranean macis we enjoy is wonderful. We have everything, everything that people go and buy out, they just grow natural here. <laughs> Mortella means uh, the place of the myrtles, is the name of the myrtles communis. This is Elicrisum italicum growing among the rocks. We have a lot of euphorbias, of course. This is the dendroides, but we have cistus, we have lavenders, all natural. In between, of course, so you see the, the, the change in the pace of the landscape, everything changes. And the garden, the upper garden, is a garden of sun and light and wind. This is the beautiful caper that grows again in all the crevices. And this is a typical, uh, you know, scene from the upper garden. So you see, you, you can, I think, understand how much this changes. It's just, it's like having two different gardens. This is probably uh, closer to what you as a group know and experience uh, in terms of gardening. This is a typical Mediterranean garden. A lot of people feel more comfortable here. We have olive trees, we have cypress trees, we have Quercus ilex that are native. Uh, as well as carob, uh, as uh, uh, the, all the brooms of different kinds, uh, and so on. Look at these wonderful cascades of uh, creeping rosemaries that we planted all along our ramps. Now, of course, in this kind of climate, so dry, so windy, so sunny, so wonderfully Mediterranean, a lot of other plants have uh, arrived and uh, and. Uh, take part of the picture from all over the Mediterranean world. So here you will, you will find all the Australian, Californian, South African and Mexican plants you can think of. We still, we are constantly improving this part of the garden, this part of the collection, because Lady Walton had only sort of started this. She died in the year 2010. And since then we have kept working on her, you know, guidelines. So we are um, improving and enhancing all these aspects that I'm talking about. So you see wisterias, um, um, mimosas there. And uh, when you, you know, sort of, and finish this climb up the hill, you arrive in a sort of level area where the main focus is uh, this archway and this rock you see here. This is known as William's Rock. And this is where the ashes of William Walton were buried by Lady Walton with two beautiful inscriptions one in Italian, one in English, that commemorate the author and this incredible uh, overlook to the bay and to the village. This is a really moving place. Imagine that in her will, she put, uh, uh, you know, she under um, stressed that she, she told us that we always have to grow 
something that has blue flowers in this little bed here because William had blue eyes. And this is the only thing she really wanted. For the rest of the garden, she was a very intelligent woman. And she said, I don't want the garden to be frozen, to remain as it is. Don't, you know, with a misunderstood sense of respect, uh, I've seen so many gardens lose their soul once the founder died. I want the garden to grow, to be improved, to follow your uh, inspiration. But only for this little area, she made it a point, blue flowers. And what uh, so in this part of the garden, of course, you will see everything that you find uh, in typical Mediterranean gardens. Uh, uh, so native plants, native plants, and then other plants. These are the ecumes that uh, self-seed throughout the garden, wherever they like it, wherever they want. And people who follow me in, uh, uh, on Facebook will notice that I, I often publish photos of ecumes that are blue, white, pink, all the possible shades in between. We have a huge collection of agaves and aloes, and uh, most of them came from donations from collectors. This is one of the wonderful things of these gardens. It attracts friends. So every now and then it has happened that, uh, you know, collectors, botanists or so, arrive with gifts, but sometimes it's a whole collection that is, uh, you know, donated to our garden. This is another cycad. This is the Encephalartos altensteini, that is uh, one of the uh, cycads from dry areas, and it has this beautiful silver foliage. So it is uh, uh, planted near the rock. The rock gives back a lot of heat, and it really thrives in this corner. And again, you see other agaves and mimosas that are sort of counterpoint to them. And uh, this is a, a, sorry, this is not a beautiful picture because it is a frame from a video taken from with a drone, but it gives you an idea of what this upper garden is. So here we have William's Rock. This is the Temple of the Sun, which was a, an old system from water that Lady Walton converted into a sort of um, uh, nursery house. Here we have a water garden, a crocodile that I'm going to show you in a short time. And on this, uh, Right hand side, there is the, what we really call the Mediterranean garden. This is the entrance of this uh, temple, this uh, old uh, um, water system, converted water system, which inside has a sort of a folly of uh, um, decoration inspired from uh, ancient mythology, and then again, uh, uh, tropical plants. You see there's music. Uh, uh, the whole decoration uh, recalls the myth of Apollo, which was a god of music, but also the god of woodlands. And so it links, uh, again, the music and the garden. And this is the view from the door of that temple. Very, very beautiful, very astonishing. The collection of the aloe has even its own name. We have a garden of the aloe, and here we tell the story of this donation that I mentioned to you. And they're wonderful because they add flowers uh, in the winter time. Uh, now, except, uh, of course, in these last two years, we had to be closed during the winter due to the COVID emergency. But uh, um, in the previous years, we had started to be to open to the public in the winter as well as the summer. Now, through in, an, in your average year, we have about 70 to 80,000 people visiting the garden when we open from April through October. Of course, the winter is less, but we like the idea of showing the garden in a sort of unusual uh, vest. And again, this look at these cascading rosemaries, so beautiful. And this is a native palm tree. This is the Camerops humilis that I think the first one Lady Walton planted. She took a plant in Capri and planted, and now it sells seeds in the garden. A little close up of the aloes that take these wonderful shades when they are a little bit suffering on the drought side. A couple them paired with the South African daisies and Moroccan helichrysum. This is the water garden that we have on one side of the hill. This is known as the crocodile pool because there is a statue of a crocodile that Lady Walton imported from Thailand. And it's, uh, yes, here you see the, the good old crocodile, the croc, we call him. And, uh, and uh, this water feature goes on to the top of the hill. Again, the cycads, the beautiful uh, Encephalartos manicensis. And uh, the, uh, this beautiful water lily is the Nymphaea cerulea from the Nile. And it is, uh, uh, practically it is, has naturalized. We don't grow it any longer, it does it all 
on its own. It sells seeds in the water and comes back every year. Uh, the back of this uh, uh, hill garden becomes more oriental in, uh, in spirit. Uh, it has bamboo groves, uh, it has uh, maples, you will see it later, uh, Japanese maples, but it also has wonderful brufelsias. Uh, and this is the old uh, ageratum, uh, today it's called Bartlettina fetida, terrible name. And that's again the Bartlettina, you see the maples, uh, the Chuzan palm, so again, an oriental thing. Bartlettina again, I love the lilac. Uh, this is a Brunfelsia, a beautiful, the, the, sorry, a Tibukina, that's another uh, shrub that grows in purple, that side of the garden is all that shade. And this is the beautiful Alpinia zerumbet, it's a shell pink uh, um, ginger relative. The bamboos, the bamboos grow everywhere. Fortunately, last year, one of the clumps uh, started to bloom and then died because we had no more space for them. So I replanted with not with clumping bamboos, not runner ones. And I would advise everybody to avoid running bamboos as much as they can. And uh, the Oriental Garden has some interesting things such as this beautiful um, temple. I mean, they call it a little temple garden temple for the geniuses of the garden. This was bought in Thailand. Lady Walton used to go very often in Thailand because a relative of her lived there for a while. This is a Japanese maple. Incredibly enough, I mean, uh, Japanese maples growing in a Mediterranean island, it seems totally crazy, but they do in full shade. They never, except this little rays you see here, very early in the morning, otherwise they would burn. And all that um, oriental area ends up with this, with the Thai house, which is a sort of a garden pavilion that was imported with very difficult operation from Thailand in pieces and then reassembled here. It was an adventure. In another side of the upper garden, we have uh, the entrance to the Greek theater. I, I, I don't want to talk too much about this, but I have to mention that as a foundation, we have a huge cultural program connected to music. We have concert uh, throughout the year, uh, youth orchestras in the Greek theater that overlooks the bay here. So it is an open air auditorium and chamber music uh, concert in the museum, which is uh, uh, near the house, uh, where every Saturday and Sunday, we have concerts with young musicians sent from the most prestigious music schools uh, uh, of Italy and abroad. We have many. Lady Walton really believed in encouraging young musicians. You see, the, I love this picture of her with a, a group, this um, young group of musicians coming from uh, uh, Philadelphia this time. And uh, when she created the museum that you see here in the back, she made a point of inviting, starting inviting young musicians. We've been through this uh, acting, you know, operating in this uh, uh, project for more than 20 years. So at a rough calculation, more than 2000 young musicians have performed at La Mortella in the years. And this is part of the museum where uh, William Walton's own piano is still uh, shown to the public together with the, his uh, uh, gowns uh, of uh, a master of music from the universities. And this is the last bit I want to show you in a corner of the Mediterranean garden. We have something that looks like a formal uh, garden, a little bit of a maze, really. It was built by Lady Walton as uh, her own uh, memorial. Actually, she said, uh, you're going to be so busy when I pop off that I better prepare my own memorial now so that I, it is done the way I want it. And um, it is, uh, there is a little fountain that says that this corner is dedicated to Susanna, who loved, uh, uh, worked with passion, loved, uh, tenderly loved with with passion and believed in immortality. And in this uh, little corner here, you see, um, this, is, this was done actually on the day that we buried her ashes in this corner here. And this is her inscription. I know I mentioned her a lot of times. Uh, Susanna Walton for us is really the genius lodge of the garden. She is behind everything. She is the strength that has brought this garden to the world and has left it to the world because we are open to the public. We are a charity. So the, the future of this garden is uh, that of continuing to be that. So I want to finish my presentation with a wonderful photograph of this incredible person, this incredible woman. And I hope I am in time. There's still time for some question. 
This is Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Perfect. Beautiful presentation. Beautiful woman. Clever. And also, you know, you carry, you've got some big shoes to fill, Alessandra. Vero. I know. <laughs> I know. But I have to say, I don't know if it, uh, if I managed to convey that, probably the most important thing in this garden is that we love it and we enjoy it. There's a lot of passion. We have fun working here. So it makes everything easier because we really believe in this mission. Fantastic. Um, okay, I think I saw some, um, somebody was actually asking about Genius Lodge, uh, I think. And I think, William Jan, you had your answer there, correct? Genius Lodge means uh, the, uh, yeah, the genius the of the place. Yeah. Uh, and it is uh, um, a, a sentence that is used uh, since uh, I think the 1700 mm. to uh, identify the special soul of a place. So what uh, that uh, the kind of that uh, um, series of characters of uh, features that create a special atmosphere in a place. So for us, uh, it is a person, but in other places it could be, you know, a desert garden, of course, the genus loss instead of a desert and so on and so on. It can be a romantic you place. Have to remember, she was, she was an immigrant and her garden has that sense of it. There's yes. so much from other places. It hasn't, you know, it's Definitely. to be an Ischia, but it also has so much from, 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 from everywhere else. From everywhere. It is, I think it is uh, uh, really in this sense, it's, uh, um, it conveys what was her personality of being so multicultural, so international, so open to everything, interested to everything from the small local uh, orchid, wild orchid perhaps, or, or little local plant to her Argentinian uh, trees uh, or to the rarest and most expensive cycads and so on. Everything had a space in this garden. We have nasturtium growing in corners that we raise from seeds or maybe they sell seed and I have daisies when I want to. I mean, we really have everything funny because people always think that they will only find a sort of sophisticated gardening. There is really, and nothing is, uh, I mean, this year I have ricinus communis growing in some areas of the garden. And ricinus is uh, probably one of the simplest and widespread plants in these areas. But uh, everything has uh, the right to be here. It's just we we you know we have fun in growing things. Um, are there other questions, Yvonne, from the chat? Uh, Very briefly, um, somebody would like to know how many square meters is the is the garden, and it's, somebody else would like to know how many people work at the garden. Okay, so more or less is two hectares. Mm -hmm. and, and then we also have, as I mentioned before, a woodland area. Uh, the garden has no uh, grass, no turf at all, no lawns. It's high maintenance, actually. It's very high maintenance because it's very overcrowded. Mm -hmm. And we have five gardeners full time. And then I also have three maintenance people, that is, uh, um, mason, plumber, electrician, painter, they do everything. So they maintain the structure. When we open to the public, we also hire uh, people that work in the ticket office, in the tea house, in the shop, uh, cleaning and so on. So it's, it's quite a big operation. Mm. May I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, Marta, hi. Hello. Yeah. No, Marta, no, 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 no. Before you say anything, I have to say this to the group. The <laughs> very first time I came to La Montella, I was with this lady, Marta, because she was in charge of the artistic uh, uh, operation at the American Academy at the time. We were together when we met Lady Walton the first time. She was very passionate when we started to talk about plants for hours and hours and hours and hours without uh, focusing on the uh, reason for our visit it was this exhibition on Russell Page. And in the evening, when we went to the hotel, the first thing Marta said, I will always remember that. She said, I had never seen anything like this happen. This was love at first sight between me and Lady Walton. You should come and work here. She <laughs> was the first one who said so. And I told you, Marta, no, come on, this is impossible. But I will always remember, she had a vision. She said, 
this was it. She saw myself already what on clicking. Yes. So, well. well. I had not been back to the garden since that visit. And I can truly say, Alexandra, that you have fulfilled her vision in such a beautiful way. Your talk has been fantastic. And it's been, how can I say, just marvelous to see what you've done to the garden. And Thank especially you. the upper garden and to, you know, just the whole joy. It's just radiating through your words and through your photographs. And she would be in joy. So thank you. thank you. Thank you. And I will definitely come back now that we can travel again. And yes. visit. it would be lovely to come back and see. Of course you have to. <laughs> Good. Thank you. So congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Fantastic. So I think there's lots of compliments coming through. Lovely presentation, stunning presentation. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I don't know. I, I uh, there's, um, Thank you, Alessandra. That's such a wonderful presentation spoken with such passion for both Susanna and the garden. We will visit as soon as possible from Delia, who's an Italian member, and so on. And I can only echo their words and thank you so much for- Thank you, everybody. Again. It's been <laughs> a fantastic you. opportunity to reconnect and, um, and, and be with you and pass time with you. It's been very, very great. Thank you for everybody uh, for joining us from all over the world. Um, are there mm -hmm. any more questions before we go? I don't want to cut anybody off. I just, I just have a comment, uh, uh, Angela. This, this book is a wonderful. You have it. If you don't have it, you should seek it out. Uh, I first saw it at Borders Bookshop in London in January of 2003, which is about a year after it was published, and. And I got a copy. I, I'm a little fuzzy on, on how or where I got it, but it arrived in, uh, in, in June of 2003. And I just am reminded that it was autographed by uh, 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 Lady Walton. And, and this, after I saw this book, it inspired me to schedule a trip to the Bay of Naples uh, about a year later to visit uh, the garden and uh, it was uh, definitely has been a lasting inspiration for my own garden as it uh, continues to evolve. Great, thanks for the, the tip. You. I wonder, is it still in pop? Is it still in in um, print? No, I, I'm afraid it's out of print. We are thinking of uh, uh, you know reprinting it, maybe adding a chapter to mm. explain what has happened afterwards. Yeah, definitely. All the evolution of the garden and Fantastic. our story. Okay, well, do that. I just say one last thing, Angela. I just wanted to thank everybody, but especially I want to say that I'm so happy to see a lot of people that I met through years, uh, you know, uh, MGS travels and so on. I'm so pleased. It's good to see you all. It's good to find old friends. And I, I want to say also, I saw that there is Sean somewhere, Sean O'Hara, and he was here while Lady Walton was creating the Nymphaeum, the last plant that I. Uh, the last part of the garden that I showed you, her memorial, and he was the one who suggested her to plant uh, uh, the shrubs that you see there. So oh. I, I don't know if he remembers that, but he's been a champion of our garden for quite a long time. Thank you very much. I, I, do, um, I do very much remember that conversation with uh, Susanna um, <clears throat> and that whole visit. We stayed um, in the garden a week um, it was quite something, and yeah, I, we didn't see half of it. Um, and it, it's so wonderful to see everything you've done. And um, yeah, it's it, it's a beautiful place, mm -hmm. and it I can't help but promote it because of the extraordinary quality of of the place. Well, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, George, Mary. I'm so so glad to see you all. And uh, well. It's a joy. And now tell me, say good luck because tomorrow we're opening and I hope that visitors will come back. Good luck. <laughs> if they come through. Buona fortuna. Buona fortuna. Grazie. <laughs> Thank you. Grazie mille, Alessandra. Grazie, grazie tanto. Veramente. Grazie to you. Okay. Oh, bye. Now, bye, bye. Bye, everybody. See you next time. Nice spring. Bye. 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 bye.